You know, a lot of people get their idea about psychology and psychologists from movies and TVs and books where they're kind of portrayed as having these superhuman powers where they can tell what's going on in someone's mind just by the a gesture they make with their face. Um, a lot of people think psychology, you know, is, is not a science. Well, it is a science. What is the need for it, though? Um, aren't a lot of the findings common sense? Isn't there just a lot of intuitive things out there that we can observe and figure out, like giving children sugar makes them hyper, uh, or that our brain, we only use 10% of our brains, all those kinds of things? Well, sometimes intuition can lead us astray. We're going to look in this section at some of the fallacies of our human thinking, and we're also going to look at the, the methods that psychologists use to study what's going on in someone's mind and their behavior. Okay, it's an important part of this course as the AP exam has a fairly high weighting on this section, so you need to know it inside and out. So apply some of those memory techniques that you remember from way back when. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so the need for psychological science. You know, here's the learning objectives. Take a second and look at those. Make sure you know what we're looking for in module four. Try this, just to see how your common sense is. If you could take a piece of paper this size, which is 0.1 millimeters thick, and you could fold it, now obviously you can't do this, but if you could fold it 100 times, how thick do you think that paper will be? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. What kind of an answer you're gonna come up with? Here it is. You might be shocked to find out this is the number. I can't even say what this number is. It's so large. But that's that many times the distance between the sun and the earth. That is huge. You can check this, by the way. Go ahead and Google it, and you'll see how the math is done on this. Intuitively, we most of us are going to think this is wrong unless we've heard this before. So can our intuition lead us astray? And our human logic, is it full of fallacy, or do we actually know what we're talking about? A couple of errors that we have. Here's one that's really common that shows um, that people's minds don't always know exactly what's happening. It's called hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is the new it all along phenomena. This is something happens and then you go back and you after the fact and say, oh, well, everybody knew that was going to happen. People in the stock market, stockbrokers and stuff and analysts, when the stock market crashes, they'll go, oh, well, it was due for a correction. Well, why'd you have your money in there? Um, Terrorism has become a big deal in the United States and a lot of parts of the world. And people say, well, of course it was going to. Look at what we've done with our immigration laws. All of those kinds of things. Um, you might have been on a test, having a test in class, and then you answer a question, you get it wrong, you find out the right answer, you go, oh, I knew that all along. That's the I knew it all along phenomena. And it is one of the fallacies in human thinking. Another one is overconfidence. People tend to think that they know more than they actually do. Take a look at these words down at the, at the bottom of the screen here. How long do you think, if we gave you these scrambled like this, how long do you think it would take you to un unscramble those anagrams? Well, most people said it would take about 10 seconds, yet on average, it took about three minutes. People were overconfident in how long they could do this. This is one of the reasons that we tell you, you should probably try to overlearn everything that you're learning in your classes for your tests, because we tend to get overconfident. Passive learning, like just simply reading or watching a video, we go, oh yes, I knew that all along. I'm very confident, I'm gonna do well on the test. And unfortunately, it doesn't work out for a lot of us. So this is why we want you to overlearn things. Another thing that we do as human beings when events happen, we want to look for order in that randomness. For example, if we look at these poker hands down in the screen, which hand are you more likely to get? Well, your chances of getting either of those hands is precisely the same. It's 1 in 2,598,960. But because there's order in one, we think it's some kind of strange event. Consider this for a second. Let's say there's only 7 billion people and we have surpassed that mark in the world and there's a one in a billion chance something is gonna happen to somebody each day. Well, that's gonna happen seven times every day in our world. There are so many strange things and we like to put it together as there's some kind of supernatural thing occurring or whatever. There's even cases where people think, you know, I've dreamt, somebody dreams of someone they haven't thought about for 10 years and that person dies the next day. 
It seems so out there. But if you do the math on it, we'll talk about it in class, it actually should happen about seven times a month in North America. So randomness sometimes look like order, but we like to look for order in randomness, and it's usually a mistake. So we need to approach it. One of the biggest things you, to get out of this class is to develop a kind of a scientific type of attitude, which is curious, skeptical, and humble. Okay, the curious eagerness. You want to find out things, you, but you skeptically scrutinize competing ideas. So this isn't saying you're a skeptic, like nothing is absolutely right, I'm against everything. It's looking at it, scrutinizing it. If somebody comes up to you with a research finding, you, go, you start to think about, okay, does that make sense? As far as where does this information come from? Who are you quoting? Who did this research? The survey, how big was the sample? All of those kinds of things. And you need to have open-minded humility. Open-minded humility just basically means like you need to accept that you don't know everything. And if somebody shows you something and it passes your criteria, that perhaps you will adopt what they're talking about and not just think that everybody is stupid. We call it critical thinking. So critical, this is what critical thinking, it's not putting everything down again. It's using this scientific kind of attitude. We look at assumptions, we examine them, we make assumptions. We assume, as we talked at the start of this thing, of this section, about sugar making kids hyper. Well, there's an assumption. How do you know that makes them hyper? Have you looked at research on it? And if you have, you'll find out the research kind of bears out that no, it doesn't really cause hy hyperactivity in children. Again, assessing the source. Are there hidden values? We all have values. We bring them into things. We want to, uh, we want stuff to show what we want it to show. It's called a confirmation bias. We'll look at anything that we can find to confirm what we already believe or what we're trying to show. Now, psychology is not value three, value free as far as results. The method is entirely value free. It's like any other science. So it's the same kind of thing. We want to confirm the evidence and assess the conclusions made from any kind of research findings that we may may see. So in module five, we're going to move on into some of the theories and uh, theories and and the scientific method that was developed. Francis Bacon, again, was a big part of this. If you remember way back from the history, it wasn't that long ago, but you probably forget. Oh, wait, you used your memory stuff. Make sure you're tying things in together as you go through. Make things personally meaningful. So we're going to look at the scientific method. It starts with a theory. A theory is more than a mere hunch. A lot of people, you know, look at it. Well, it's a theory. It can be wrong. Well, let's keep this in mind. Uh, numbers are a theory. Algebra, algebra is a theory. Um, evolution is a theory. A lot of these things are theories. Now, the difference between a theory and something that happens all the time, which we know is a law, would be like a law is every single time. Gravity is a law. When I drop a pencil, it falls to the ground because gravity pulls it every time. That's a law. However, our explanation for it would be the theory of gravity. So if you're in an argument, uh, say someone's arguing about creationism and evolutionary ideas at the beginning of man and someone says well you know that's just a theory well that's not a really good argument because theories are usually quite tested they're based on education uh, educated guesses based on a lot of observations more often than not but from that theory what we want to do is develop a hypothesis the hypothesis is a statement and it can be confirmed or denied. It can be shown to be correct or incorrect. Now, as a researcher, you're not really, you don't care if you're correct or incorrect. Well, you do because that's what you're trying to find out. But it's also important to find out that your hypothesis may not be correct. Usually worded in like an, if this happens, then this will happen. So you know exactly what it is in your research that you're trying to determine. Often we need operational definitions. Let's say, for example, our hypothesis is if you take this pill, then you will become more intelligent. Well, that's great, but we need to define some of these terms. Um, the pill will be defined by the pill that we have, but the, a big operational definition here would be intelligence. What is intelligence? It means something different to everybody. So we need to have a definition that we can use in that research. So maybe for intelligence, we'll define it as 
um, a score on some specific IQ test, intelligence quotient test that we give somebody, and that will be our definition of intelligence. Is that intelligence? No, but for the purpose of our research, that's how we're defining it. Therefore, if we do our research, give it to some other researcher, they can actually redo that experiment, which we call replication, and they'll be testing exactly the same thing you were. So it's kind of a, a, a big long circle. There are theories, then we create hypothesis, then we do research and observations, and then we revise our theories, and then we create more hypothesis and so on and so on. It, it really never ends. In, in scientific, scientific methods, we never really say anything is really proven if it's done through this kind of research. We just refine theories to the point where we almost accept them as fact, like numbers and those kinds of things. So a good theory is quite useful if it organizes a range of self-reports and observations. Okay, so it's based on some kind of idea and it can lead to a cl clear hypothesis okay, that anybody can use to check the theory. Remember the hypothesis again is the if and then statement. It, it, you can read a, look at a hypothesis and you'll know exactly how that research will be conducted. Okay, and it often stimulates research that leads to a revised theory which better predicts what we know. So we're increasing our knowledge every time we do this kind of research. So we're going to look at some of the descriptive methods we have. Now, descriptive methods really don't tell us anything um, about causes or um, how something will affect something. What we're looking at is basically describing that situation. So one of the methods we have is a case study. A case study is when we look at one individual in depth. So we'll look at them from all sides and spend a lot of time looking at that one individual. It's useful, especially if we want to find out that one individual's experience, but the problem with case studies is you can't really generalize that information that you got from that one person to the entire population. Okay, but they are very useful when we have a typical individuals say somebody there's something rare somebody's going through a unique situation we want to find out what it's like for them however we again cannot generalize that to general pop populations naturalistic observations are done as well and they describe behavior again it does not explain but naturalistic observation is when we look observe make observations in someone's natural environment so we want to observe a student with adhd do a naturalistic observation, we will observe them in their natural area, in their classroom, for example. We have to be careful. Um, we don't want to get in the way and make them know that they're watched because there's a thing called the Hawthorne effect, which actually means that if you are the subject of some kind of research or observation, it will change your behavior. The Hawthorne effect was named that way because this Hawthorne was doing research and was in a, a company and they want to see if workers produce better at different levels of light. And when they did the, the actual research and they changed the different levels of light in there, they found out that every change of light actually increased productivity from their baseline from before. So what was happening? The workers know that they were being watched, so they changed their behavior. And anytime there's some kind of research and you know you're part of it, you will change your behavior to a certain point. So surveys, these are those annoying things we get on our phones. We get them online. We get them over telephones. They're, they're, they can be quite annoying and often they lead to scams. But a survey is really useful because it can look at a lot of cases at once. Um, if we want to find out uh, something about the population of our school, we can easily do a survey and ask people and then gather the results. They're easy to do um, as far as the administration of them, and they're quick to get results. Okay, they can have problems because there's surveys that have gone out about the same things that come back with entirely different answers. And a lot of that is probably because of wording effects. So wording effects is how the question on a survey might be worded. So for example, there was one survey that found that 77% of people were interested in plants and trees, but only 39% were interested in botany. Botany is the study of plants and trees. It's the same thing. Or a total of 48% were interested in fossils, but only 39% were interested in paleontology. So that's different. Also kind of wording effects that can happen is if we say can't allow as opposed to forbid. Um, 
or shouldn't allow. So television should not be allowed to advertise cigarettes. We're probably going to get more people agree to that than if we ask television ad advertising of cigarettes should be forbidden we're going to get different answers so we have to be very careful when we do our surveys how we pick our questions we'll look at some more examples like that uh, in class two of wording effects so the way to get a good example and this is kind of interesting the, uh, 1500 people can represent an entire nation the size of the united states in fact during the election which is happening around now uh, down there all this stuff when they do the polls they usually only poll 1500 people and if it's done properly it'll give you a really good overview of what the population is thinking but it has to be a random sampling how do we make it random it has to be random so that every single person in the entire population has an equal opportunity to be part of our research okay it, we don't want to have sampling bias this might mean that we uh, we interview or we survey people that all are from one geographical location that might have ideas that are different than people from other geographical locations. That would be a sampling bias. Okay. Um, other things with surveys, if we're actually out there asking questions, sometimes it makes a difference if you're a male or female asking the questions. For example, when interviewed by a man, 64% of women agreed abortion is a private matter that should be left to the woman to decide without government interference. But when interviewed by a woman, 84% of women respondents agreed to that. So just the person asking. So there are lots of little facets of surveys that need to be paid attention to if you're going to come up with, with numbers or the descriptions that you're looking for without having anything else interfere with it. So the random sampling again is really an important idea. When we sample uh, a population, say we want to find out at our school uh, something, we're looking, we're surveying how many people spend an hour, at least one hour studying uh, at our school. And so our population of this research is the entire school population. So a random sampling though has to be taken from that population and the random sample has to be people that we've taken that everybody had the same chance. How can we do that? Um, maybe we could have a list of names. We could get a random number generator and use, you know, number the names off it and use it that way. Uh, maybe we can write them all down and pull them from hats. There, there are many different ways that we can accomplish this, but it has to be done. And it's one of the most important things that we do. Now, the larger number of people that we sample, the better our results are going to be. But once again, if it's done properly, you don't need a huge part of the population. So again, we got the sampling of the group. We got a population and the random sample like we were talking about. Okay, and then we're going to stop it right here. And then in the next section of this one, we're going to start to look at correlational studies and also the experiment. So once again, naturalistic observations and um, case studies and surveys are all descriptive kinds of research. Again, they don't tell us what's going to happen. Okay, so we'll see you next time for part two of this unit. Bye for now.